Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural HECA webinar, the HECA Electrophysiology Update. Thank you very much for registering. Thank you very much for being here. The demand, the interest in our webinars exceeded our most optimistic expectations. We have over 230 registrations and many of you, the majority, is already here and it seems people are still dialing in. Thank you very much for your interest. We hope, well obviously the expectations are high and we hope we will not disappoint you. Let me briefly tell you what we're going to talk about today. The title is the HECA Electrophysiology Update. I'm Jan Dolce, the VP of Sales of Mar uh, Marketing at HECA Electronic. What we're going to talk about today is a couple warm words for welcome, a little housekeeping in the beginning, there will only be a few minutes. Then Telly Gajatsatos is going to talk about chart recording with Patchmaster software. After that I will give a brief feature of the EPC-800 dual control patch clamp amplifier. And then Hubert Affolter is going to talk about combining imaging and electrophysiology. That will take about 50 minutes combined and then we will have a Q&A session. If you cannot hear us, well then you can't hear me right now, so I'll leave this slide up for a little while if people have difficulty getting audio. The audio is transmitted over the IP connection, but if you have problems or if there are no speakers connected, you can dial in at one of these numbers. You can ask questions during the talks and we will collect them and address them at the end of the, uh, the uh, Q&A session. So in the Q&A section, in your session control panel, which by default is at the right of your screen, you can type a question. Please indicate which speaker the question is directed to. For some it's obvious, but for some it's not quite that easy. And all questions will either be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of this event, or if there's too many questions, we will address them offline by email. You also have a chance to give us feedback. After the webinar, you will automatically be directed to a short survey. And what are we asking? Well, obviously, we would want to know how did you like it today um, so that we can optimize that and improve on what's gone wrong today. Well, this is our first webinar here with HECA. Uh, so bear with us if one or two things might not be that ideal. Um, we also want to know your scientific application, what you do, so that we understand what your needs are and where your feedback is coming from. Um, and then also you, can, you have the opportunity to uh, give us your opinion about future developments, what products should we make going forward that uh, help you get your research done better. You can also um, ask us to get in touch with you if you need tech support or if you want need product information or a quote. And we try to keep that survey as short as possible since well, your time is as precious as ours. With that, let me introduce the first speaker, Telika Yatsatos, graduated at Queen's College um, from computer science, then joined Instratech as originally an IT uh, support engineer in 1987, stayed there for 20 years, uh, was the general manager in the end and since the merger of Instratech with HECA to be HECA Instruments in the USA, he's general manager of HECA USA. And with that, let me switch to Telly. Okay, Telly, you're on. Uh, thank you, Jan. Okay, so um, the goal of my presentation today is to go through a step-by-step -step the various settings required uh, in the pulse generator, the online analysis, uh, and the protocol editor, um, which will lead to a patch master configuration that provides both a high-resolution acquisition and a low-resolution chart recorder. Um, I will be using the EPC-10 USB uh, to test the configuration with a model cell attached. Uh, why chart recording? Well, there's many applications where monitoring is required. Uh, we can monitor capacitance, capacitance measurements, 
uh, to monitor fluorescence over time. Uh, actually, this is part of Hubert's uh, talk today. And this example, we're using it to monitor self-health. Uh, we're going to monitor the series resistance. Uh, we want it to remain as low as possible. Um, and we will also monitor uh, membrane capacitance. Uh, we want that to remain stable. Okay, with that, so I will jump into uh, Patchmaster. So I'm using Patchmaster in its default configuration state. This is basically the way it would come out of the box or in today's standards downloaded from the website. Uh, so the first thing the Patchmaster always asks for is for the creation of a data file. Uh, even though acquisition can be executed without a data file being opened, uh, it's always a good idea to, uh, to create a data file. Um, you could always delete unwanted data, uh, but uh, if it wasn't stored, you can't retrieve anything. So with that, we'll create our data. Let's give it a name, test. So when, once a data file is created in the control window, the store button will also be enabled. Uh, this button basically allows you to enable or disable uh, the storing to disk. Uh, for those who are new to Patchmaster, I'll give you a quick overview of the screens that we have here. We have our amplifier control window, uh, our oscilloscope display. We have our replay window. This is where our data tree will be built and all our data will be stored in here. We have our online analysis window. This is the results of the plots that we're going to be generating. And finally, the control window. This is where we can execute all our pre-programmed uh, pulse generator sequences as well as our protocol files. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to make a couple of minor changes uh, for the online analysis as this is what we'll be looking to for our results. So first I will just make a couple minor changes. And I will also activate the second window because we'll be using that as well. Okay. Now let's get started uh, with the EPC-10 control window. Uh, in addition to all of the hardware controls for the EPC-10, uh, we also have a built-in pulse generator as well as some uh, user selectable uh, buttons these actually tie to the protocol editor uh, usually patchmaster will s will pre-program them with some default settings based on what amplifier is specified uh, and we will use these as we're preparing for our recording uh, as i mentioned earlier we will be using the model cell uh, for uh, for this so let's get started with that um, so first i'm going to put the model cell in the 10 meg ohm position uh, this circuit will uh, basically simulate a 10 meg ohm pipette open to the bath solution. So here we go as our test pulse is running. And we'll run setup, which will basically execute. What it does is uh, it will change the gain, set the recording mode, uh, preset some settings uh, for the amplifier, and then perform a V0, an auto uh, offset correction. Uh, if any correction is applied, it's added here to the V0 control. So it's 0.1 millivolts, quite small. Okay. Next, we're going to move the model cell to the middle position. This, this basically uh, simulates the formation of a giga seal uh, with approximately 6 picofarad capacitance. Uh, as you can see, we have some fast capacitance transients in our current trace, and those could be neutralized by executing the seal button. And here we go. So you see all the fast capacitance have been neutralized. Finally, we'll put the model cell into the 0.5 gig ohm position. This will simulate a model cell uh, with the input resistance of approximately 5.1 meg ohms, a membrane uh, resistance of 500 meg ohms, and a membrane capacitance of approximately 22 to 23 picofarads. Uh, we, all, we have here uh, the slow capacitive transients. Those could also be neutralized by executing the whole cell button. And you can see uh, determination did not complete, uh, would not fully complete, so we could just execute it one more time to, to do that. Okay, uh, we're almost ready to go into our recording. Uh, next and final thing we need to do before we leave the amplifier window is to specify a holding potential.
Uh, so we have a, we set it to minus 100, and now we're ready to start our recordings. Uh, before we could do that, though, we need to generate a, a pulse generator file or a, a stimulation sequence. So we'll do that from the pulse generator. Okay. So Patchmaster includes a number of uh, preset files for both uh, the pulse generator for the online analysis and the protocol. Um, typically, I recommend that people use one of the pre-programmed uh, sequences and just modify it for their needs. Uh, what, what I will do is I could actually start from scratch, just so I can show everybody step by step. So first, we find an empty button in our pool, and we give it a name. So in this case, I'll call it IV Demo. Oops. Sorry. Name here, I the test. Okay, sorry. Okay, so we're starting off with basically a clean slate. Uh, so for this example, we're going to be uh, basically creating a three-segment sequence uh, that will give us an IV relationship. So we start off basically where we have uh, three segments. The first and the third segment are actually equal to the holding potential, so we need to set that. And our second segment here is where we're actually going to be doing the depolarization steps. So we'll start off our initial value of minus 60 millivolts. And we want to increment each step by 10 millivolts. As you can see, this had no impact yet because we have to also make a change for the number of sweeps that we actually want to do. So we're going to be doing nine depolarization steps. We enter nine here. And here, and here now in the sequence cartoon, you have a good representation of our stimulation pattern. One additional thing to make this accurate is that we need to specify what the holding potential that we, we are planning to use. So previously in our amplifier window, we specified minus 100 millivolts. So we enter that here. Now please keep this in mind that this is only for display purposes. It's only used to update the sequence cartoon. It has no interaction with the amplifier itself. Okay, so now that we have our stimulation sequence, we need to specify what channels we want to acquire. So we start up with some default settings. Uh, we're using the stim D to A output on the EPC-10 amplifier, and it actually also has a stim scaling applied. This is a value uh, that needs to match the amplifier, and it's saved in the configuration file. For our input channels, we are going to be recording from the current monitor 2, which is our filter 2 output, as well as our voltage monitor. So we'll add that as well. So here's our voltage monitor. Okay. Now, one more, uh, two more additional things that we can modify in the timing is the sample interval, the sampling rate of our acquisition. For this example, 50 microseconds will be fine. And also a sweep interval. So a sweep interval consists of the sweep length plus any additional delay that we want to add uh, in between sweeps. So let's say we're going to put here one second. Okay, so now we have that. Now, finally, the pulse generator can be tied to an online analysis method. Uh, we haven't defined the method yet, but we do know that what is our relevant sequence, uh, sorry, segment of interest. So we know that this is the segment here, segment number two, that's going to be changing. So we're going to add that here. So basically this just defines a, a region of interest for the online analysis. Okay. Now, we could execute this uh, stimulation sequence directly from the pulse generator or from the control window. So for now, I will close the pulse generator. As you can see, it was added to our control window, and we can now execute it from here. Okay, so. So unfortunately, I had set, specified some, uh, some very large scaling factors before I started, and now so part of it started off the screen. So we could easily just reset for trace 1 and then for trace 2. 
and now then now we can modify our our display the way we would like so typically what I like to do is I like to use the keyboard to do that which basically will allow us to adjust the scaling factor and the offset factor so first we specify the channel or the trace that we want to work with and then I will use the uh, shift minus or plus key to move up here we go and we'll also scale our current trace a little bit and then we'll do the same for our voltage trace Okay, and now we could actually acquire, do one more test just to make sure we can see what we want on the display. All right, so here we go. Here's our voltage, our steps, and our response, our current response. Okay, now we can go into the chart recording or the online analysis. So for that, we open up the online analysis window. Again, there's already some pre-programmed uh, methods already in, but we'll start from scratch. So what we'll do is we'll find a blank button as well. Now we'll do this IV test. And we will not copy anything. We'll start from scratch. Okay. So this, to design our online analysis, we first have to define the functions, and then we have to create a graph, what X versus what Y. So first, let's start off with our functions. So click to get our function list. And we have, as you can see, quite a number of different functions to choose from. Since we're looking for a current to voltage relationship, we're going to first get our current, which is mean. We have a default name, which we could actually change. And also, we could tell Patchmaster where uh, to get the data, where to compute this data. So either we go to the relevant segment, which we specified in the PGF, or we could set the cursors relevant to the whole trace, beginning to end, and then modify the cursors. So we'll do that segment, and done. So that is uh, our first function. With this function, we could specify cursor bounds. Again, another to minimize the region where we want to calculate this data. We could also tell it what channel we want to get the data from. And we could also add this value to the notebook. So as the online analysis is being computed, this value could also be added to the notebook for bookkeeping purposes. So let's add another function. This time, we're going to add our amplitude. So we have our current function and our uh, voltage. So now we go and we specify our graph. So here we will enable our graph here and here. And then we specify here. All right, so here we have, we have our graph, what x versus what y. Now we go in and we want to modify the axes. So the easiest thing is to specify an order series axis. What this will do is, after all of, all of the sweeps in a particular series have been acquired, it will take a, a min-max of these values and then compute the axis automatically. But this means that the plot here will, will not occur till after the acquisition has terminated. In this case, we're doing more of a chart recorder style, so we want actually to use uh, a scaling where it's actually computed after each sweep. So what happens here is that after each data point is, is computed, the axis will be drawn based on that one point, and then with each new point, the axis will be recomputed and redrawn. And we'll just set overlay to make sure that we're not clearing out any of the old data points. Okay, so the f and finally we need to say, okay, this graph, what position do we want it? We have two windows we could choose from. So here, we will, I will disable any graphs from previous online analysis. And I will say that I want this on online window number one. And that's where it will be drawn. All right, so that is our first online analysis. We want to now here, this control will tell us how this method will actually be executed. No online analysis means that nothing will occur when we do an acquisition or a re or playing back of the data. We could have use selected method, which basically forces this um, 
method to be executed for any new acquisition or any replaying of data, or automatic stimulus control. Now, automatic stimulus control is what ties it back to the PGF. So, let me do that, and let me go back to the pulse generator. And here in the pulse generator, we will specify what analysis method we want to run. So here we have IV test. And we close that. Now, when we execute IV test, as you could see, the, the traces are the current trace and the voltage trace is there, and our data points are also shown in the on online window. Okay, now let's try to expand this some more. And by the way, I just noticed that I did make one mistake with this. I should have mentioned that it was for trace number two. Sorry about that. So. Now we're going to add a few more functions to our online analysis. So go back to our function, and we're going to get timer time. This is the patch master acquisition timer that's specified in the control window. It could be reset from the control window. We'll add another one called, these are now trace parameters. So we can go R series, R series resistance. And finally, membrane capacitance or C slow. Again, it's another trace parameter. Okay, so now we have a few more functions that we could graph. So we'll go back up to our analysis graphs. We'll create a second graph. We'll enable it. So, and let's go here and put in what we want, what our X and Y is going to be. So we'll go with timer and our series for one of our graphs. And we'll enable a third graph. This one will be timer and C slow. And now again, same thing, we have to specify uh, the scaling of the axes. Again, I'm going to use after each sweep. graph and for this one as well. Okay, and finally we need to put uh, what positions they're going to be drawn in the graph. So this time we're going to use online window number two. So here we'll put graph two in position number two and graph three here as well. So now we have an online method called IV test that has three graphs. Uh, one, the IV on uh, window number one, and then R series and C slow in window number two. So we could execute that as well. Okay. Now, let me close this window and make this a little easier to see. Now, so this was during an acquisition, but if we quickly wanted to go and actually replay back any of our acquired data, we could just go here to our replay tree, find a series that we're interested in, and double click on it, and that will give us our results for that acquisition as well. Okay. Now, this is a good time to introduce uh, the protocol editor. So with the protocol editor, basically will allow us to generate a sequence of experimental events. Uh, it's a programming style language. We have all sorts of loop capabilities like repeat. We have all sorts of conditioning statements built in, but we're going to start with a simple one where we're just going to repeat one of our series five times. So we'll go and find a, again, a blank. And we will not copy. Okay, so first what we do, and here we have where we can specify what commands are available, or what events are available, I should say. And we'll start off first with a repeat. And here with repeat, we can specify the counts. 
5. Then insert after is we are going to acquire a series or one of our stimulation um, sequences. And we could select it from the PGF pool. And here's a list of all the available uh, pulse generator sequences that are on our file. IV test. So here we're now we have a very simple uh, repeat loop. It will do, uh, it will just acquire uh, this sequence IV test five times. So I'll move this out of the way. And again, now you see back in the control window, we, this new uh, pr protocol has been added as well. Execute it. And actually what I'll do is I will try to flip through the model cell here to try to get some additional data points stored in here. Okay, now uh, with R series and C slow, since they are trace parameters, uh, they're they're usually uh, updated every time an auto C slow is executed from on the EPC10 amplifier. So we could add that now to our protocol editor. So here we go back, and right before this execution of the series, we're going to add what we call an amplifier control. Okay, so now we're going to execute an automatic C slow that before it executes each of the acquisition series. So execute that. Okay, so basically, these were the basic steps for getting a chart style recording um, handled, configured in Patchmaster. I mean, the protocol editor could be expanded e even more. We could add uh, the execution of or additional PGF templates or additional sequences and other online analysis that will keep these uh, basically this monitoring of uh, either the series resistance or C slower or any other parameter uh, ongoing over any length of time. Uh, but that will be, I think, for our next webinar. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for listening. And let me switch over. Sorry. And let people know that there are pre-configured tutorials on our website. Uh, basically, they have all the files for the configuration, for the online analysis, and for the PGF for a variety of different tutorials. We have a chart recording with Patchmaster. It's more enhanced than what I've shown. Uh, capacitance measurements, fluorescent measurements, and also using a recorded waveform of stimulus for stimulus. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at uh, ussales.heca.com or you can call me or always our support line is always available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Telly. Um, and with that, I'll go back and make myself the presenter. Meanwhile, I would like to encourage the audience to use the questions panel in your go to webinar control panel there's a questions field where you can ask questions I see a few questions have already come in during the talk uh, I'm pretty sure there will be more and we will address them at the end of the webinar or uh, offline by email with that let me switch back to showing my monitor too with the presentation where two worlds meet. Remember the agenda, this is a short feature of the EPC-800 dual control patch clamp amplifier. Since, um, well, I'm going to have to introduce myself as the speaker. My name is Jan Dolzer. I graduated in Germany, as you may hear from my weird accent, uh, with uh, insect sensilla, actually uh, olfactory sensilla, the perfume receptors 
um, on uh, moth and sorry I forgot to mute everybody else here sorry about that let me do that real quick um, then joined Axon Instruments in 2003 and stayed on through several mergers left Axon in early 2011 to work with Sutter Instrument for a year and a half and since late 2012 I've been the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Hika Electronic. So what I'm going to talk about today is what I call the old world versus the new world. Patch Clamp has been around for a couple of decades now so the physiognomy that means what the electrophysiology, the Patch Clamp electrophysiology looks like has changed over the time um, and what we try doing is create what I call the ultimate user interface and we're going to look at what planes, cars and patch clamp amplifiers have in common there. Then I'll briefly go into a number of features, not all of them, uh, of the EPC-800 amplifier controls and their meanings, both how they are implemented in hardware and in software. And finally, in a summary, I'll give you a little bit of a decision guide between an EPC-800 and an EPC-10 amplifier. That's the two main amplifier lines that we carry these days. So let's take a look at the old world. Traditionally, the flow of information in not only patch clamp electrophysiology, but electrophysiology in general was you had a recording that was done with an amplifier with knobs and buttons, and the analog signals were then digitized in an interface, in a digitizer, and we carry three different ones, and recorded by a software, by Patchmaster in this case. Um, that controlled the communication between the digitizer obviously and the software made sense of the data stored them to disk uh, and recorded them. What's not shown here is that the software also puts out stimulus signal obvi uh, signals obviously that the preparation would see then. So what does the new world look like? Starting from this uh, same scheme, we would skip the step of the digitizer, or would not skip it, but would actually integrate the digitizer into the amplifier. And HECA has a long-standing history with doing that, starting with the EPC-9 that was released in 1988, and these days the EPC-10 amplifier, which has also gone through several iterations, um, combines the amplifier and the interface, so the digital conversion is actually done in the same step. Still the same thing is done under control of Patchmaster software that makes sense of the data points that are coming in, but that also controls the amplifier. Not only generates a stimulus signal, but directly controls the amplifier. You see no knobs and buttons at the interface here, and again that started with the EPC-9. So that was a completely new paradigm, um, and a paradigm shift generally poses a challenge how to create the ultimate user interface. Is a software, purely software controlled amplifier actually the way to go, or should it be knobs and buttons or something like that? Well, in trying to answer this question, we looked a little bit across the fence and looked at user interface design in general and at applications where it's time critical to operate complex machinery and where there's no room for error. One such example is if you drive a race car. You need quick, fast decisions on what you do, and if you make an error, well, then you fly off. Even more so when you fly a plane, you have many more people in your back seat compared to a race car, and if you make an error, you may spoil not, not only your own day, but uh, the day of a couple hundred people. So, the user interfaces to operate these complex machines have gone through many, many iterations of optimization and streamlining. If we look at that, the cockpit of a vintage plane, in this case a B-24 bomber, um, parked uh, in vicinity for, uh, to where I used to live and work, has a lot of controls, analog controls, a lot of gauges, uh, levers, switches, and steering columns. Um, that is many decades ago, um, and that has evolved over the decades to something that looks like this, the cockpit of a modern airliner, in this case a Boeing 777, 
and a lot of what you <coughs> excuse me a lot of what you see here um, is monitors that display a variety of information similar to what the gauges in the previous uh, picture did but they can change the content at the same time there's a lot of controls that are still strictly analog or emulate something strictly analog and we have a very similar, uh, uh, oh, sorry, and in reality most of it is fly-by-wire these days. There's no mechanical or hydraulic connection anymore between the controls and the actuary actuators like the flaps, slats, or the landing gear. In a situation that many of us are more familiar with these days, if you drive a car, um, you also look at a number of controls, but very few of them are still actually connected to the actuators. And in this example, the only thing that has a mechanical connection to what it affects, on, what it has an effect on, is the steering wheel. The steering wheel has a me mechanical connection to the steering mechanism, to the front wheels, but everything else, and that includes the gas pedal, and I'm not completely sure about the Audi in the shown here, but uh, many cars, the brake pedal has no hydraulic connection anymore to the brakes. It's all done by uh, electrical actuators under the control of the onboard computer. The uh, gear selector of, of the automatic transmission in this case has no mechanical uh, uh, connection anymore to the gear. So this will be a drive-by-wire approach. And again, the look and feel is still like it used to be a couple decades ago. You turn that steering wheel, you step on the, on, on the accelerator, which turns a potentiometer and that accelerates the car. Translating that to a patch clamp amplifier, so patch by wire means, well, you have what actually is, or at least looks like an analog control, knobs and buttons, but what it does is it controls digital circuitry behind the scenes in many cases. And that's the old world interface, the new world interface of that same amplifier is the cockpit of a modern patch clamp amplifier, the EPC-800 amplifier in this case, and there's three flavors. One is the purely monitoring flavor that only shows you uh, values like uh, the, the, the current or the voltage monitor or the membrane resistance. Um, you can also monitor the gain. You can have a tuning mode in which you have a few more controls like the whole cell um, compensation controls here or you can have the mode where you see it all and can control it all at the same time. The one decision you have to make before the experiment is are you going to uh, drive yourself or are you going to use the chauffeur today? So let me, uh, take, let me briefly take a look at a couple of the features. As I said, I'm not going to be exhaustive here in the interest of time. The front panel of the EPC-800 amplifier looks like this. It looks like an old-style uh, amplifier with knobs and buttons, but as I said, there's more behind the, uh, behind the scenes. If we look at this group of controls, the gain control, for example, has three ranges which uh, select the feedback resistor in the head stage, and the corresponding software control looks like this. You select the gain here in a software interface. The recording mode, whether it's voltage clamp, current clamp, or low frequency voltage clamp with different time uh, constants. Again, the corresponding software uh, interface looks like this. The current filter that's used as the, um, the anti-aliasing filter as well is a, a dial, a, a knob, the RS compensation with tower and percent compensation or the external stimulus filter and the corresponding software controls. Taking a look at the wholesale control section, you have C fast and C slow compensations in this example and this is what the software user interface looks like. One big advantage over a true old-style analog amplifier with knobs and buttons is this. You still have an auto function that can be um, can automatically compensate for the C slow or the C fast in this case. And finally you have a 
multi -mo multi-function display that can display a lot of parameters that you want to monitor but then also in uh, auto display mode where it cycles between all the parameters um, you can also uh, set the amplify and seal test mode where the seal value is cycled in in this case and that can also be put out on an audio connector what about the amplifier performance? Well, that, of course, is one very important aspect for a patch, a patch clamp amplifier. The amplifier performance, for the largest part, is equal to the, to the well-established EPC-10 computer-controlled patch clamp amplifier. I just want to highlight one example here the Red Star, with the Red Star head stage, which ships with the lowest, uh, latest revision, revision T uh, of the instrument, has a noise as low, pretty much as low as it gets at 30 femtoamps uh, with a 1 kilohertz bandwidth. The rest of the, uh, the other uh, specs are, as I said, for the largest part on par with the EPC-10. So as I promised, a quick buying decision or a, a buying decision guide, is the EPC-800 the right amplifier for you? So if you ask a question, do you like the tactile feedback of an analog control, like potentiometers, flick switches, yes, then it's definitely the right instrument for you. If you do a lot of teaching and you want your students to understand the basics of patch clamp recordings, yes, then it's the right amplifier for you. If you already have an interface and a data acquisition software, then you may want to consider the EPC-800 as a replacement for your older, your broken amplifier potentially. And that may even be the case if you prefer third-party or have third-party interface and acquisition software. The EPC-800, for example, supports the telegraphing of Axon Instrument software, of the p software, and fits right in as a replacement amplifier there. But there's also situations when the EPC-800 is not the amplifier for you. For example, if you want to record from multiple cells at the same time, then the EPC-10 double, triple, and quadro patch clamp amplifiers are the, uh, the instruments of choice because obviously there's a price advantage if you have multiple amplifiers but then this, uh, uh, the same digitizer in, in one housing, uh, but also in terms of operation it's easier. Or if you have used HECA's EPC-9 or EPC-10 amplifiers for pretty much ever and you never missed anything, then this, it's very, very likely that the EPC-10 will much better need, uh, meet your needs than the EPC-800. With that, thank you very much for, the, for your attention for my talk, and I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Hubert Affolter. Hubert graduated in Switzerland and did postdocs in Switzerland and a number of places in the U.S., um, North Carolina and at Yale University. Joined Instrutech in 1989 as a software engineer and shortly thereafter joined Hicker Electronic and is today the senior software architect. And Hubert will talk about combining imaging and electrophysiology today. With that, let me change the presenter over to Hubert and also unmute him. Okay, Hubert, your controls. Thank you. Okay, in my presentation, the couple of following minutes, I will try to explain how Patchmaster is going to support combining imaging and electrophysiology in the same setup. So our, our goal is to acquire imaging data simultaneously with electrophysiological recordings to preserve high timing resolution and exact correlation. It means that both traces are supposed to be able to look at in the same time frame with millisecond if not microsecond resolution. <clears throat> we want to compute region of interest data and display them on and offline and we want to be able to retrieve imaging frames corresponding to any position in the data stream. Okay, so when you have a, um, something which happens in your physiological data, 
we support or we want to go and support that you find the next frame which corresponds to this exact phys physiological event. Okay, the first thing is what type of hardware can we support? You need a camera. You need a camera which is able to be controlled by triggered acquisition. So a digital trigger starts the acquisition and controls readouts. We need a filter wheel or a monochromator to change the wavelengths if that is needed by your experiment. And of course we need the amplifier which will acquire the physiological data. And we need a computer controlled amplifier so that we can control camera and amplifier together in sync. Okay, so we want to acquire current and imaging with precise time synchronization. Here you see a representation of the imaging part. So we send digital triggers to the camera which defines when the camera acquires and when the readout starts. At the same time we control the wavelengths of the monochromator or the filter wheel. Then the camera acquires frames. Each acquisition of a frame is triggered by the digital trigger. We can for example alternate between two wavelengths and then you would have frame 1 and 2 together is a pair and we can make a ratio then 3 and 4 again together and so forth. So we extract then the mean uh, fluorescence of a region of interest and that gives us one point in a trace, in a sequence of region of interest information. In this example it's always first, third, fifth and so forth. And then we can extract the same from this, the next frames and these will allow us to do ratiometric fluorescence. And then in the same time frame we acquire the cell response which is evoked by the stimulation of the cell. So these are all the signals which are acquired at the same time. Synchronization and build up of this stimulus is controlled by software. So here is the end is that we obtain separate region of interest traces. Out of them we can measure the ratiometric trace or also the calcium concentration. In the same real time frame, we have the frames, the current, the voltage, whatever other signals we have, we have the region of interest computation. And offline, we can go out and repeat that. We can display current and voltage, we can display the corresponding frames, we can replay the movie, and we do, can do region of interest recomputation and recalibration. Okay, so how does that work? How are the different components interacting? The master of this universe is Patchmaster. Patchmaster talks to the analog and digital board, so it controls the central heartbeat of this acquisition. The D2A will control the position of the monochromator, will send digital triggers to the camera starting frame acquisition and readouts and at the same time controls the amplifier. And in this case it also acquires current and voltage. Then the camera, the frames in the camera are read out per second uh, application which we call imaging. The imaging then extracts the region of interest information and sends this uh, information back to Patchmaster. And Patchmaster synchronizes with this application so that it is configured to the right experimental conditions. So instead of having two systems, two keyboards, two monitors, you have one application which knows to 
talk to the specific device and everything is synchronized. So we support a couple of cameras from different uh, uh, companies. We do that through an imaging library as IDX. We support different filter wheels and monochromators from Sutter, from Delta RAM, from PTI, Polychrome and Olychrome from TIL Photonics. Okay, how does that look like in Patchmaster? One goal of this application of this extension was to try to keep the user interface as simple as possible <clears throat> and hide as many what we call quirks steep buried in the software so that the user doesn't have to deal with them. So this is the pulse generator window. You have seen the pulse generator window in the talk of Tele and it's not much different. So here we have the imaging channel control so you can activate an output channel define it as imaging. This takes care of controlling the, the camera. And then you define, if you need it, a channel as wavelength control. So this channel will take care to set the wavelengths. Wavelength control, camera control, okay. And over here, on the input side, you can define region of interest traces. In this example, we have two. And then there is a small additional button. If you click on that, another window opens and shows you those parameters which the user has to supply. What does it mean? It means that the user has to decide how much light do I have to do be, to have enough light to, during an exposition. So he has to say how, what's the cycle time, how often is it, are the frames being acquired, what is the read time which a camera needs, so the, these for two, uh, for one to three wavelengths. Help in doing these things if you don't know them, for example, you don't know the read out time, then we read this information from the camera and make sure that the value which is here is the appropriate for the different cameras. So in the imaging application, the information related to the camera so what can the camera do? What's the minimum exposure time, for example, is defined and controlled by this application. So in the different windows you can find out what the camera can do and you can set up the imaging conditions. Down here, for example, you have a tab which allows you to set the region of interest in the frames. So you can, once you have decided the parameters of the camera you want to use, you can click on Prime. Prime will send your selections back to Patchmaster, so the Patchmaster makes the appropriate adjustments. So here is the connection to Patchmaster. Okay, so what are the features of these combined measurements? We can have Camera live mode means that the camera is constantly read out and displayed on the computer screen. You can make a camera snapshot, means at any time you can make a snapshot and store it with timing information so that later you can play it back. For example, you could take a picture before you go and you do a patch clamping in a slice. So it can be very simple but it can be very handy. It can do automatic or manual scaling of the camera. It shows and computes the histogram if you need that. Histogram means uh, it gives you an overview of precision and colors in the frames. The mouse tips can you show exactly pixel information like position and intensity. The frames are stored as diff stack. You can have multiple uh, region of interest defined and retrieved back. This definition, which is called region of interest mask, is, is safe 
with the image stack, so it can always be retrie retrieved and analyzed. The background subtraction we support, calculation, different of fluorescence or calcium concentrations. This item, storing it as a TIFF stack, this is a standard TIFF stack, so this guarantees compatibility to other imaging programs, for example, to J imaging. Okay. Here is what you would see on a high resolution time frame in the main oscilloscope. So I plotted here an example where you, we have few region of interest data and an IV, meaning the current voltage relation of a physiological data. So you he see here one trace with two data, that's the region of intra interest uh, of trace one, and this is the region of interest in the trace two. So you see that you, you have a high resolution time, you know exactly here this frame has been acquired and this was the other frame. Here we have the current. Okay. Now, what Helio already mentioned is that we can show the data also over longer time with a lower time resolution. You see down here, this is an example which went over 12 minutes and we display the data of the fluorescence at 400, fluorescence at 470, the ratio and the seal resistance of the cell. The seal resistance of the cell gives us, in this ex experiment, an overview of the quality of the cell. Is the cell still being patched in a reasonable way? Okay, so why, how is the connection done between the recordings and the imaging? Okay, so at time of acquisition, we made a snapshot here. You see that this pipette is going to apply a chemical challenge to this cell, and we have the two region of interest defined. So then when I click on this acquisition record, it will show me this frame, and if I, okay, with the two region of interest. If I click on this target, it will show me the next frame. You see that from here to here, this cell has been fully activated and the pipe is gone. Okay. So you see that the correspondence of this recording or the snapshot which belongs to this recording is displayed on the imaging window. And the same on the high resolution. If you click anywhere in the oscilloscope, it will show you the corresponding frames. First click, second click. And here you see our cells with the different fluorescence intensity, and you see the two regions of interest which we have defined. So here are a couple of ex uh, examples of real-life data. We have here two regions of interest being displayed in the analysis window. We have the ratio being displayed. We have the R series being displayed. And the result of the background monitoring. Okay, so the last trace allows us offline to recalibrate our data to have a calcium concentration computation. Again, here we have two different frames. You see the pipette for the drug application. You see the result here. We have the current response. You have the region of interest of wavelength 1 is red. The region of interest of the second trace, uh, of the second frame, the second wavelength. Green is the ratio of the region of interest traces. And here is the overview of the experiments over 12 minutes. Again, we have the region of interest, we have the ratio, we have the R series as a quality of patching of the cell, 
and we have the background again. Okay, so we have started developing the system with the following goals. We want to acquire imaging data and physiological data. That works. We want to preserve high time resolution and the exact correlation. I have shown that this works as well. We want to compute region of interest both during the experiment and later so that we can recalibrate our system and that works well. And finally, we want to be able to retrieve frames corresponding to any time position in the physiological data stream and that fortunately works as well. Okay, so that's the overview of what patch clamping does when you need to do simultaneous recording together with imaging data. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Hubert. Um, with that, I'm handing over to Lars for the questions, but uh, before that I have browsed through the questions a little bit. Um, uh, one of the most frequently asked questions, no, the most frequently asked question is, is there uh, going to be access to the webinar after the event? Yes, this event has been recorded and the recording will be available no later than I would anticipate early next week, probably earlier, and we will send a link to everybody who has registered by email. So yes, it will be available and we completely realized that what we showed here was uh, very dense uh, stuff and uh, some of it you may want to go through again. So that recording will be available online. Okay, so uh, I'm handing over to Lars who will moderate the Q&A session. Thank you, Jan. So first of all, we have really a lot of questions and uh, unfortunately we don't have the time to answer all of them. We are already five minutes late, so we'll only answer a couple of those and the other questions, we'll answer them per email. So your questions are not lost. So first I have a question for Telly. So Telly, how can an EPC-10 be made to export, export continuous sweeps? Oh, c continuous sweeps uh, export to what format? So uh, let me see if I could share my screen again. Um, would that be possible, Jan? Uh, give me a second here. Yep, you're on. Okay, did I have the right screen though? Yep. yep. Okay, so uh, so if we've nope. acquired the data already, we have a couple of export okay. types. So let's go up to um, the replay window. This is, what, this is the link, this replay menu, sorry, is the link to our replay tree. And we have um, export full sweep is what covers continuous acquisition. So the difference between the two, so export will only export what we actually see on the oscilloscope display and export full sweep will export the entire sweep even though it's not displayed on here. So for, for continuous acquisition uh, this is the export you want to use. Now depending also on the export format if it's Igor or ASCII or so forth uh, you'll have different export types. Uh, for example for Igor Pro we don't actually export the data but what we do is we create uh, what we call an Igor recreation macro and Igor actually points back to the original data file. So it's not actually uh, exported, but it points back and then gets added to a wave. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Telly. Another question for you. Is it possible to run an online analysis on data that have already been acquired, or can it be done while running the protocol? Oh, yes. So uh, in the online analysis window, we have this method. So automatic stimulus control ties it to the PGF. But if you want to change that online analysis, you could just go to use selected method. And basically, whatever method is activated when you're replaying back your data, that's the one that will actually be used. So you can change that uh, at any time. So if you're going back from to a data file from many months ago and you decide you want to change some of the analysis, uh, this would be the best way to do it. You just specify here, so use selected method, then as soon as you replay back the data, that the, the active method will be used. Okay, thank you, Telly. Then I have another question which uh, is addressed to you, but I think Hubert probably is more the one to ask. 
Thus, the imaging extension for Patchmaster allows fluorescence imaging with an old Visitron system from the 19th until Polychrome 2 as light source and the camera as Princeton Instruments Pentamax. Okay. Um, I'm afraid not. The imaging extension requires high time resolution and that is enforced by the digital control of the camera. So a camera which doesn't have external trigger control, what the camera's manufacturers call a bulb control, then we don't support that because we wouldn't be able to have control over timing. So those camera which just acquire at random, but that's from, from our point, at random, they cannot be controlled by the this imaging extension. Also, let's go back. This imaging uh, extension is a high time resolution e solution. There are solutions which are working slower, so it's possible to extract information for other of, of, from other systems in different ways, but that's something which we have to look at the specific device, what it can do and how one can synchronize the imaging system, which usually is already in place, how can we synchronize that to and from Patchmaster. So that's something which we, or the support line, are very willing to work on it and look at it and give you a specific question. Uh, a specific answer to this question. Thank you, Hubert. Another question to you. Does Patchmaster work with PCO pixel fly cameras? Okay, I don't know this camera. I'm just a software guru on the Patchmaster side for uh, questions relay, relaying to specific cameras. Please contact uh, the helpline of they will be able to give you specific uh, answers to specific uh, cameras. Well, in this case, since the, the question was brought up here, we will uh, forward that to support and address it offline. Uh, one more comment on the previous uh, question regarding the TIL uh, polychrome. That portion is supported. Yes, the monochrome uh, the, the control of, of monochromators and filter wheels, um, that's quite generally available to all the systems. My re, uh, reluctance in answering questions to cameras is that the camera itself and the acquisition, when the camera starts and when readout has to occur, that's the part which is test technically very difficult and specific for every single camera. But filter wheels and field and monochromators, that's, let's put it uh, plain, usually quite easy. Okay. okay thank, thank you. Question to Jan. Can you comment on EPC7 versus EPC10? Well, yeah, it's, it's uh, the user interface, obviously, the software control in the EPC10. Um, and uh, other than that, the, the specifications have been completely re revamped. The EPC-10 is a lot lower noise. There's the automatic compensation features. It's yeah, com uh, comparing uh, apples and oranges, and uh, yeah, one of the two might be kind of old. Jan, correct me if I'm wrong, but the EPC-7 is not being produced anymore, right? So actually it would be like, what is the difference between the EPC-800 if one wants to buy an amplifier right now and the EPC-10, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And uh, the, the EPC-800 obviously has the analog controls that you can use alternatively to the software controls, not in parallel. So as I mentioned during my talk, you have to decide before the session whether you want to drive yourself or take the chauffeur. Okay, so another question for you, Jan. How does the price of an EPC-800 amplifier plus interface compare to an EPC-10 amplifier, which, which has a built-in interface? Right, so at first, uh, um, 
we we would have to compare with an EPC-10 single because the EPC-10 comes in double, triple, quadro flavors as well. Uh, the EPC-800 is a single channel patch clamp amplifier, so that will be the, the, the comparable bit. And actually the combination of the EPC-800 and any one of the three interfaces that we offer, uh, it's a little bit cheaper of the order of 10% uh, than the EPC-10 single. Okay, then I want to close the question and answering session here. We are already about 15 minutes late and mm -hmm. give back the mic to Jan. Okay, well, uh, with that, thank you very much. I have a couple uh, acknowledgements. First of all, obviously, I want to thank Lars for moderating uh, the question, the Q&A session. Um, Shannon for a lot of help with the uh, organization in the background. And last but not least, to over 230 people who registered for the webinar, and it looks like a substantial fraction of those uh, showed up today. I don't have the final statistics yet, so I don't want to give a number or a percentage or something like that, but uh, roughly the same f fraction that we would anticipate. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for your attention. Very few people dropped out towards the end, which is quite unusual. Um, and let me reiterate that, um, well, first of all, let, let me say that the, the session will remain open for a few more minutes, so anybody who still wants to type a question has the chance to do so. Those will be addressed by email, much as the questions that we did not get a chance to address now. And also, as I mentioned before, recording of the webinar will be available online within the next few days. All registrants will receive a link by email at the email address that they are uh, registered with. And with that, I'll put everybody uh, the audio on mute. And as I said, we'll leave that open for five or ten more minutes. And thank you very much for attending. See you at the next webinar or our user meeting at the Society for Neuroscience Conference in San Diego this November. Thank you and bye-bye.